Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the Cancer Solar Festival webinar of the 2025 initiative. My name is Alexander, and I welcome you on behalf of the 2025 Initiatives Coordination Group. Today, we come together under the energies of the Cancer Full Moon to reflect on the vision of the plan as it manifests on a physical plane, as a lighted house of our lives, lighted house of our groups, and lighted house of humanity. Our guests today, Dwayne Carpenter and Rose Bates, will share with us their vision and will lead us in meditation. And before we start our work today, let's create a group field connecting through ethers, coming together as one group, strengthening our telepathic connection, linking in a group mind and a group heart. Visualize our circle where each of us of us is a point of light coming together from different parts of the world, forming a ring of fire. We visualize the group heart center magnetized and empowered by the radiance of our individual hearts. And we expand the radiance of our group hearts, aligning with the heart center of our planet, the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. And we visualize humanity for whom we serve. And we realize us standing between the hierarchy and humanity in loving service, offering our group space 
for certain great ideas to be expressed and radiated. Thank you. Dear Dwayne, dear Rose, please lead us and share. Welcome. Well, thank you. And um, there's a little bit of background noise. Do you hear that, Sasha, or is that good? Um, your voice comes very clear, so I okay. think we are good. Very clear. Okay. Well, Dwayne had, I had originally wanted Dwayne to go first, um, but he had said that I should go first. So here we are. So I need to somehow show my screen. And here we go. Let's see here. So can everyone see that? Yes. And I would just like to, first of all, say welcome from Indiana. And um, Dwayne is in California. And welcome to everyone who is in all different time zones around the world, really forming the one, the one group. So the title of this is From the Vision of the Plan to the Manifestation of the Lighted House, is a title that Sasha came up with that I feel is so embodying the aspects of the cancer sign that we are in right now in the manifestation of the lighted house as the keynote of cancer. And I thought this little image of a lighthouse with the light in it would be fitting. So in this presentation, we're going to explore, the, um, I have to move this out of my way, it's covering my screen. Okay, in this you can minimize the control panel by uh, using the arrow, uh, orange arrow. Yes, I got that now. Okay. In this presentation, we'll explore the vision of the plan and some of its manifestations. I will focus on the plan as the fusion of esoteric science with that of modern academic science. And Duane will lead the exploration of the sign cancer as the synthesizing agent for the cardinal cross including the science of astrology, relating it to the science of electricity, and seeing their common goals and similarities. So what is the vision of the plan? I'm going to explore some, um, oh, it's, it keeps, when I hit the enter key, it comes back up. I got to figure out how to get this here. Sasha, is there a way I can keep the control panel to the side? All right, let's try that. The, the orange arrow, that's the best way to keep it away. Okay, let's try that. So the aspect of the plan I will focus on is what we're very familiar with, the esoteric sciences. And as we know, there was a cycle initiated in 1875, which brought forth a renewed wave of the ageless wisdom teachings for the Western world that had been preserved in the Eastern traditions. And we're very well familiar with the pinnacle work which H.P. Blavatsky brought forth and the theosophical movement, which is spread throughout the world, laying a foundation for the modern acceptance of the esoteric philosophy as a counter to extreme materialism that was going on then and that we also have now, but I would say to a much lesser extent now. So some of the aims that H.P. Blavatsky stated for the secret doctrine were 
The aim of this work may be thus stated to show that nature is not a fortuitous concurrence of atoms and to assign to man his rightful place in the scheme of the universe. And finally, to show that the occult side of nature has never been approached by the science of modern civilization. As we know, the hierarchy lays their plans out in cycles, great cycles and smaller cycles. And at each centennial conclave, the, plan, the plans for the next 100 years are laid. Nearly a century has passed since the 1925 conclave. We see more mainstream acceptance of the esoteric science in the field of academic science. And also around 1925-1930 is when the field of quantum mechanics really started to come onto the scene. I find it uh, not just a coincidence that that occurred within the time frame of this hierarchical conclave. But before we get into that, let's look at some quotes uh, from the Tibetan on the plan. After noting and watching this trend of affairs for another 100 years, the elder brothers of the race called a conclave of all departments about the year 1500. Their object was to determine how the urge to integration, which is essentially the keynote of our universal order, could be hastened and what steps could be taken to produce that synthesis and unification in the world of thought, which would make possible the manifestation of the purpose of the divine life, which has brought all into being. When the world of thought is unified, then the outer world will fall into a synthetic order. And that's from Treatise on White Magic, page 402. You might here ask, and rightly so, what is this plan? When I speak of the plan, I do not mention, I do not mean such a general one as the plan of evolution or the plan for humanity, which we call by the somewhat unmeaning terms of soul unfoldment. These two aspects of the scheme for our planet are taken for granted and are but modes processes and means to a specific end. The plan as at present sensed and for which the masters are steadily working might be defined as follows. It is the production of a subjective synthesis in humanity and of a telepathic interplay which will eventually annihilate time. It will make available to every man all past achievements and knowledges. It will reveal to man the true significance of his mind and brain and make him the master of that equipment and will make him therefore omnipresent and eventually open the door to omniscience. That's a very interesting definition of the annihilation of time, which we'll get into a little bit later. And as a quote from Blavatsky, when she's speaking of time, she says, time is only an illusion produced by the succession of our states of consciousness as we travel through eternal duration. And it does not exist where no consciousness exists in which the illusion can be produced, but lies asleep. So we can see from the above two quotes that the wider vision of the plan is to go beyond or supersede time and hence consciousness. Two are, you cannot really separate the two. And to identify with being if we can use such a phrase, that part of, this, part of the process to do this is the unification of thought. 
we see this happening now more than ever before with the rapid integration of the scientific community with the laws and principles expressed in the esoteric sciences we're so familiar with. So the fusion of esoteric and exoteric science. It's a famous quote from Nikola Tesla where he says, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomenon, it will make more progress in one decade than, in, than all of the previous centuries of its existence. And there are hundreds of thousands of scientific um, research articles, programs, and in documents that from all fields of science, whether it's near death or um, um, uh, like telepathic phenomenon and or to the more conscious side of things. And I'm just going to briefly look at just a two very small examples of this very wide field that has rapidly grown into the mainstream consciousness of humanity and the academic scientific world in the last 100, 150 years that I really see was kind of inaugurated with this conclave of 1875 and 1925. So almost a century ago, Max Planck, the theoretical physicist who originated quantum theory, said that he regards consciousness as fundamental, that matter is a derivative from consciousness and that everything we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. That you cannot separate the two, that the phenomenal world is a product of consciousness, just like the earlier quote from the Tibetan and H.P. Blavatsky, that the illusion is produced by the consciousness and academic science and physicists are saying the exact same thing. And Eugene Wigner, the theoretical physicist and mathematician, stated in the 1960s that it was not possible to formulate the laws of quantum mechanics in a fully consistent way without reference to consciousness. So scientists are now being able to take these ideas out of theory and to document them. In September of 2017's edition of the New Scientist magazine, an article was published that was titled, We've Seen a Thought, The Secret Seven-Dimensional Life of Your Mind, and proposed that the shapes of thought dimensions are based on tetrahedrons, and that consciousness may itself be a shadow of a higher dimensional structure which in the esoteric philosophy would coincide with the principle of universal mind. And this is a cover of that, of that article. And to the right here is a pictorial idea of what some of these tetrahedron, tetrahedron images might could look like in two-dimensional form and from that we can see many parallels into the esoteric science including the tree of life in the Kabbalah and various other symbols in sacred geometry that that we're familiar with and Duane may go into briefly. These revelations and hundreds of thousands more have led many in the scientific community to rebuke the scientific materialism, which Madame Blavatsky was really a, pen, a, a um, catalyst to her work, and the model of the classic physics and the idea that matter is the only reality. So out of one such organization that sprung up is, a mo is this move in this movement for a more holistic and inclusive science is the campaign for open science. And their website is um, at the bottom there, opensciences.org. Well, they state on their site that we are a group of internationally known scientists from a variety of scientific fields, biology, 
neuroscience, psychology, medicine, psychiatry, who participated in an international summit on post-materialistic science, spirituality, and society. The summit was held at the Canyon Ranch in Tucson, Arizona in February of 2014. Our purpose was to discuss the impact of the materialistic ideology on science and the emergence of a post-materialist paradigm for science, spirituality, and society. And out of this summit came the manifesto for a post-materialistic science. It's an 18-point summary of where the field of science is, uh, has been, and is going. It's supported by 300 leading academic scientists, professors, medical doctors, and thought leaders. It's available on their website, and it's also available as a handout um, that's been, that you can get from the GoToWebinar um, thing that you have on your screen under handouts. You should be able to click on it and download it, or you can get it from their website. And a, there's just a, this is just a small list of organizations that are promoting this type of pioneering research. There literally are thousands of them. And this is just a list of, you know, maybe a couple dozen, and some of these we're very familiar with. And it, it just really, I would just love to see what, if HPB were alive today, and she probably is, reincarnated somewhere, or maybe a master or what, what she would say with the progression, I think in a relatively short period of time, of basically a century to a century and a half of where we have gone to where we're really getting into now, where science is starting to really recognize and accept because the model no longer is working for the classical um, materialistic view of the world. And when that occurs, we have the quote the Tibetan earlier gave us that when the world of thought is unified, then the outer world will fall into a synthetic order. And I would just like to say that this quote is not to be confused with that we, that this unification of thought, it's not a thinking alike, that we all have to think alike or the same or agree, but rather it's a tapping into the higher and universal mind. Because when you tap into that higher mind, it reveals the grand or grander plan as it is part and parcel of the one reality and that is where you get the synthetic order from. And I believe with that, we'll now turn it over to Duane. Thank you, Rose. Am I on, Sasha? Uh, yes, we can hear you and now you can show your screen. Dwayne, yes. you, you, you have your headphones plugged in correctly, correct? I do. Okay. It's just some, it's like a, you had a fan on or something. There was some noise when you were speaking. I don't have any, just two cats purring in the background. Okay, you're good now. Thank you. Okay, excellent. I would like to give my appreciation for the work that the 2025 initiative has undertaken for quite a few years and the many contributors, Sasha and Katya, who have really supported this and, and guided it through so many cycles. Before we launch into the part that I'm going to share, I would like to read a quote by the Tibetan that I think is very relative to the larger idea of 2025 and what potentially is coming. First of all, the books were published and they came out 
in ordered sequence and provide a body of teaching and of truth which will serve the needs of the coming generation. It is for my disciples to safeguard this presentation of truth during this century and to see to it that the books are sent forth steadily upon their mission until they are finally superseded next century by a newer and more adequate teaching. Now that last part of the quote I find very powerful. And I think at this time historically, we've all studied and learned many of the wonderful ageless wisdom teachings that have been given. But the question is, if there is a newer teaching, how will we recognize it? We've been told by the Tibetan that the works of Alice Bailey seamlessly fused with the earlier works of HPB and that there's continuity. And so anything new would naturally be built on those two earlier traditions. And I often ask myself and I ask others who study this material, have we really fully explored and understood what's been already given as we wait for something new and dynamic. And I also think that in 2025, we're not going to have just a huge information dump. Yes, there may be new techniques, new technical outlines, but from what the Tibetan has said, it's going to be the precipitation of light. It's going to be the sounding of a, of a, a new keynote. And I want the group to sort of keep that in mind as we go through this short presentation, because it's not just the material itself that may be of some importance, but how it's presented. And this idea of using modern communications to send out a message or information to a wider group of people is very powerful. And I think when you look at the internet and the information highway, you'll clearly see that it's sort of a foundation of what Rose very eloquently shared earlier about the need for humanity to develop telepathic sensitivity to, to come to a type of synthesis and that this information highway that's being presented to us is really an extension of the etheric body of the planetary logos and one of the early formations of that telepathic work right on the physical etheric plane. Okay. With that preparatory statement, let's talk a little bit about cancer. Now, most of you who are familiar with even a cursory understanding of astrology know that cancer is expressed primarily through Jupiter and Neptune which are second ray and sixth ray astrological influences. And cancer also expresses ray three and seven. The Tibetan indicates that in the future, in these new wave of teachings that he prophesied to come after 2000, that astrologers will begin to see that there are really only six astrological signs, that every astrological sign has its opposite. And as you view the image 
on the screen, you'll see that Capricorn is the polar opposite of Cancer. And that as Cancer grows and matures and develops fully its unique qualities of ray influence, it will be required at some point to begin synthesizing the Capricornian rays, which we know are 137, in that polarity. And this is important because as we get into studying the cardinal cross, of which Cancer is one of the arms of the cardinal cross, we're going to see that in addition to the 12 signs of the zodiac being synthesized into the six signs, the six dual signs, that the, that the three crosses, and we're really only going to focus on the cardinal cross today, must be synthesized. And I have images that are going to help qualify and clarify that, that idea. And we know that in the cardinal cross, we have Aries, Libra, Cancer, Capricorn. You know, Cancer is a very mysterious sign. It's one of the earlier astrological signs, and it has a very direct relationship to the development of mass consciousness. And it's very hard to understand sometimes that something that can be on one level so mundane because it relates to the, the lower astral nature of humanity can, over a number of cycles, mature and become a stupendous sign of revelation within group consciousness. And we're going to explore that also. And it's not easy to understand sometimes the difference between mass consciousness and group consciousness. And sometimes there are subtle overlapping qualities that can confuse the student. Rose did an excellent job outlining the idea of esoteric science with academic science. And the Ageless Wisdom teachings have been indicating for centuries that there is this hidden form of energy or life called the etheric body. And behind that is the astral body and the mental body and even higher principles. But science right now through quantum mechanics on atomic and subatomic levels has proven conclusively that there is an inner grid of interconnecting energy and forces that we cannot see but affect and create everything. And if any of you, let me ask this, how many in the group, I want to see a show of hands, how many in the group have explored the EU dynamic or electric universe paradigm that uh, is emerging through the Thunderbolts project and indicates that magnetism is a very weak force in the universe, contrary to popular belief, and that it's electricity and magnetism that really uh, push and pull and guide the majority of the, of the bodies uh, physically in the universe to say nothing of psychically or spiritually. How many in this group have just, just had an introduction to that? Um, 
you now uh, can see on your screen a poll, so you can just answer this question, choosing the, uh, your answer yes or no. It's a new feature that we're using today, but it should be okay. pretty straightforward. Just sh I don't see it on mine. Um, I can uh, tell you the results. Okay. I'm not That's sure fine. I can share it with you visually, but so far 75% of attendees have responded and 46% people say yes and 55 say no. Okay. So Excellent. I would say majority of people never heard about this, but it's okay. almost 50-50. You can check it out on Facebook. Just put in the Thunderbolts project or electric universe. It's, it's profound what conventional, and I, I hesitate to use that word because conventional science is fast dissipating into the ethers as these new, new quantum sciences reveal these inner truths. Okay, Sasha, would you like to read this quote for me? The three crosses and synthesis? Uh, yes. I got a little bit distracted on the running poll. So just a second, I need to find the window with the Yes, I see it now, I can read it. In the study of the crosses, the true meaning of their influence will only appear as you begin to think in terms of synthesis or of the relation of the four streams of energy flowing unitedly upon and through any form of divine manifestation. This is by no means an easy thing to do for the ability to think synthetically is only just beginning to appear in the foremost minds of the race. It can be illustrated and then only analytically, which ever negates synthesis. Esoteric Astrology 562. This is a key quotation to a video that I'm going to share. a little later in the presentation. And here is a case, and you see this a lot with DK's teachings, where he says, I'm trying to describe something, I'm trying to illustrate something analytically, whichever negates synthesis. This is the paradox of the lower mind. We need it to build powerful thought forms to elevate ourselves into the mind of God and eventually into the intuition itself. But at some point, the lower mind cannot enter. And this is where visualized symbols and images are very powerful. In fact, if you study the Tibetan's works really carefully, you'll see that He's often speaking and giving information to aspirants and probationers and early discipleship and then more advanced disciples. But when he gets into really advanced discipleship training and people that are undergoing initiation, he speaks in the language of symbols, like the old commentary. If any of you are familiar with DK's old commentary statements, they're amazingly similar to the beautiful quotes of Agni Yoga by Master M. They're, they're scientific, but they're also poetic at the same time. They appeal not just to the lower mind, but they appeal to the higher mind and the intuition, because they create it, they demand that you create word pictures. And the Tibetan has said, 
that one of his keynotes for presenting this new Ageless Wisdom teachings is to share the new discipleship training based on visualization. And his idea is that the second ray types do better with visualized images than the other ray types. And that if you can visualize something, if you can see something in front of you, the second ray types often are better at visualizing that symbol. And once taken into deep meditation, the visualized image, which is magnetic, attracts the very forces the symbol veils. So think of the mind as one stepping stone towards the recognition of divinity. Then a graded series of symbols, another, and then finally, the direct participation in the energy itself. Rose, would you like to lead this? Read this quote. Rose is has many responsibilities and she may not uh, be available. So I think I will read it and she'll be back on shortly. A paralleling statement would be that the light of the seven centers in man, the chakras, when enhanced by the light of the seven planetary centers and the five kingdoms in nature, plus the 12 lights of the zodiac will produce a consummation of light effectiveness, which will make possible the expression of the whole. This through the medium of humanity. This is a basic statement, which means little to you as yet but which will in the next century form a seed thought or key sound for the next revelation of the ageless wisdom. So to go back to what I was saying earlier, it's gonna be light itself that's gonna be one of the major keynotes of these new teachings that Tibetan is gonna share and it can't be put down simply on paper as a bunch of theories, principles, or, or laws, however useful and necessary as a foundation. It is going to be a precipitation of light affecting the whole planetary grid. And this is where your triangle work comes in and so important. And that this work that we do in our own triangle work strengthens the triangle grid around the planet, energizing it and drawing in higher energy. In the next century, there'll be a key sound for the next revelation of the ageless wisdom. Okay. Getting back to the Cardinal Cross, this chart will be available for attendees. I'll get it to Sasha. And we cannot cover all four of the, all three of the crosses, but I can at least make them visually available to you. and you can get an idea. Aries, the direct astrological sign of Aries is Libra. When you're advancing down the path, as I stated er earlier, and Aries is becoming more fully developed, it will draw off Libra. And eventually Libra will be so inclusive and dynamic within that Aryan person, they'll be expressing both qualities because they will have synthesized one of those six dual signs. Okay, that's two arms of the Cardinal Cross, which is what we're discussing today. Now, Cancer, 
over here where my mouse is, see the red C? Red indicating spirit because the cardinal cross relates to the life or spirit aspect directly across from it is Capricorn. And when the advanced Cancer, and you can reverse this and say the same thing, when the advanced Capricorn has made progress and, and learned the spiritual attributes of the discipleship Capricorn, he or she will begin to draw off the sensitivity, <coughs> excuse me, the sensitivity in the love vibration of the Cancer. So there you have the cardinal cross, stepping it down to the fixed cross, which is like on a soul level. This cardinal cross is on a sort of an upper triadic or monadic level. On a soul level, you have the fixed cross, which is Aquarius, Leo, Taurus, Scorpio. And then we have the mutable cross, Pisces, Virgo, Gemini, Sagittarius. And we're going to talk about this in practical terms as we get towards the end of the presentation, because it may seem in some respects overly technical and maybe a little much at first, but it's good just to get a visual idea that the 12 signs of the zodiac are really six pairs and that all these different signs of the zodiac unfold through three crosses the mutable followed by the fixed and then ultimately the cardinal So once again, even though we're in the sign of cancer and we know the theme note is I build the lighted house, that has many meanings. It can be on a personal level, finding your comfortable and familiar place where you can recharge and you can feel at home. And in time, your home will expand uh, to your community around you, to your family and then eventually to your spiritual group, and then eventually to your home of the soul itself, which is on a causal level, realizing that there is no my soul and your soul, but there's really only the soul, which includes all of us. And then from there up on to monadic levels, and even beyond that to the highest aspects of these cardinal crosses that the masters wield and even planetary forces and energies from outside of our solar system pour down through the sun. So cancer, in my opinion, has taken a bad rap. It's overly associated with mass consciousness when the potential for group consciousness and universal consciousness are always there. There has been no real attempt as yet on the part of astrologers, even the most advanced, to arrive at a general or synthetic understanding of the effect of the crosses upon humanity. All that has yet been conveyed is the effect of one arm of the cross upon the subject born in a particular sign, but there is a fusion of energies to be noted when esoterically speaking, man stands at the midway point where the four energies meet. Powerful, powerful statement. And once again, this idea of six astrological signs, six dual astrological signs, and the teachings on the three crosses are only meant to be understood in this particular century. This is a wonderful quote, and we really don't have enough time to explore the idea of electricity 
but I would simply say this. DK has said, and this is a direct quote, that esoteric astrology is the oldest and greatest science that humanity has ever known. But I want you to interface that with another quote from the Tibetan, where he says that, let's read it here. The mysteries contained within their formulas and teachings, the, the key to the science, which will unlock the mystery of electricity, the greatest spiritual science and area of divine knowledge in the world, the fringes of which have only been touched. I would suspect that very few astrologers are familiar with that quote. And what is so interesting is that esoteric astrology is the most ancient and the science of electricity is the most modern. And all of these wonderful outlines and qu quotes that Rose shared with us earlier clearly outlined that fact. So there's a reason I asked for a show of hands around the idea of the electric universe model. It is the way of the future. It is the way conventional science, again, using an incorrect word because they're no longer conventional, is interfacing with the esoteric and fulfilling the Tibetans promise that in the first part of this century, that science would penetrate into the higher etheric subplanes of the cosmic physical plane, thereby releasing tremendous energy and force for the betterment of humanity. Unfortunately, the first stage of that was the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima and created a tremendous carnage, but on an esoteric level, if you can divorce yourself from the personality on an esoteric level, it began the inauguration of a new age in which energy and force was going to be seen in a new way and harnessed. Yes, it must be done in a clean way. It must be done with integrity in the respect of human life. Okay, we're going to put question and comments right here so that it will give everybody a chance to share. And then we'll have a closing meditation with a video which will demonstrate sort of like in real time and in an animated way this idea of the cardinal cross. But we'll come back to that after our questions or any comments that any of the attendees would like to share or, or the panelists. We invite now our um, participants to join the conversation and uh, everyone is muted now um, by default, but we will unmute you uh, when you raise your hand and it's a function on the control panel. Also, you can write your comments and questions in the question section of the control panel. But it's always better to hear your voice. Hello, Sheldon. Yes, well, Dwayne and Rose, this is just superb. And um, my mind is uh, so full, I can't even speak, let alone ask a question. So thank you. Thank you both for opening this great door.
Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, thank you very much for your presentation, Dwayne and, and Rose both. Um, just a thought that I had as you were discussing these things and, and upcoming potentials of, of vibration and, and ways of, I guess, telepathic communication. Do you have any thoughts on um, artificial intelligence and the augmentation, uh, human augmentation, actually, if you listen to anything from, uh, oh, what's his name? Mr. Tesla. <laughs> I can't think of him off the top of my head right now. Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk. Yes, thank you. Um, talking about augmentation, I mean, with that, I mean, of course, there's a lot of fear and speculation out there, but at the same time, um, it seems that it would be a potential for really unlocking and opening up um, a very large number of things and ways of perception um, and using our body, our nervous system and connecting, um, like you said, to this tremendous uh, highway of information. Um, do you have any thoughts on anything like that, or am I way off base even considering no, these? No, there are no off base questions. In fact, sometimes the ones that seem to be the most far removed are the ones most worthy of discussion. I've given this a lot of thought, and I have a lot of friends that are very concerned that artificial intelligence could be created in which it could become a threat to civilization for a number of different reasons. And sure. I think machines can be very dangerous if they're not used wisely. But we have to remember that humanity is a biological organism physically that is connected to all these other bodies. And the lower man gets its direction or marching orders from these inner dimensions. And mm -hmm. no matter how sophisticated you make artificial intelligence, they're never going to be able to think on the higher subplanes of the mental. All they can do is reiterate the information that's been fed into them. Now, yes, they can put the information in new and creative ways that we as humanity may not have thought of, therefore being, again, if used wisely, as a boom, as a, as a great uh, revelation. In other words, they're meant to be our servants. And this idea of pollinating uh, half human and half machines, I think is a little far out. Now, I'm not saying if you lose a limb or if you have an organ and you need a transplant, that this is not a good thing. But there's a reason for that. And this idea of creating armies of mutants, I think, is just a little, uh, well, there are armies. Our, our, these mechanized armies already exist. And they're being more electronically made and more sophisticated every single day through the industrial military complex. And we shouldn't sure. discount from this conversation the idea that uh, neuroscience is, is developing ways that the brain can interface uh, with telepathic work and new and creative ways. So I see there's an upside and a downside. Is there anyone else sure. that would like to share anything? Well, I would just like to comment on that. And hi, Chris, it's nice to hear your voice. Um, I think from an esoteric point of view, the question really has to be asked, what exactly is artificial intelligence or AI? Is it actually a form of intelligence as we would understand it from the human mechanism of of, of, of mind, the principle of mind. Is there, is it possible for a inorganic mechanism to in some way exhibit mind principle? And a lot of people will say no, but yet at the same time, we know that all matter itself, inorganic matter, you know, whether it's a, a piece of metal or or even organic matter like wood has a form of intelligence in it. And it's a very curious line that's kind of being crossed between the 
subjective etheric realms and the physical realm is there something here that's being tapped into that is of some sort of universal intelligence of matter itself even if it's a um, silicon matter I don't know what other word to put it and I don't have the answer to that I don't know that I think it's um, definitely very interesting concept of what's actually going on here and and then with that if it is a form of intelligence perhaps based out of matter then you know then there goes into the whole idea that gets a little further broad about consciousness can that take on its own sense of consciousness and we know in the esoteric you know thought that even elemental you know like a rock has a form of you know i don't know if animism is the right word but uh, uh, innate consciousness within itself so you're entering into a different kingdom here whether it's the form of elemental kingdom but there's a there is something that's being entered here that is so cutting edge in the history of humanity i mean i think it has immense potential and at the same time due to the evolution of humanity and you know our expression that we're not fully soul expression it can be misused and what exactly it is i i'm not sure but it is a fascinating absolutely fascinating realm and i think whatever benefits that can be derived from it for the enhancement of humanity's evolution consciousness expression and life should be um should be garnered but at the same time there probably is very real risks involved as well that's sure. all excellent excellent there Good. is a comment uh, go ahead sasha uh, there is a uh, comment from uh joe saying that no fear is uh, necessary group telepathy will supersede yes. ai is based on the principle of brain not mind yes excellent observation and okay, I would just add to that, to that that uh, if we think about uh, telepathical intelligence, that it's unfolding levels of telepathical alignment with the universal mind, and there is yes. no way that artificial intelligence can plug in into that cosmical hierarchy of intelligence. Beautifully expressed. Are there any additional questions? Uh, yes, I will unmute Ishtar. Please unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Hi, it's uh, Ishtar. Thank you, Dwayne, for a lot Hi, Ishtar. <laughs> Hi. Um, very interesting conversation uh, and uh, so many amazing things said. Just one little point. Um, with artificial intelligence, I think the most uh, dangerous thing is the fact that it's all intelligence and logic which comes control without the balance of emotional feelings yes. i think that's extremely important and why human beings have emotional feelings is because that should temper our logic although we're still learning to manage that i wouldn't you agree absolutely well said no oh, thank you any additional questions or comments um, uh, not at this point. I did find it extremely interesting. As you know, I'm still new to everything, uh, the esoteric wisdom. So the astrology with the Cardinal Cross is um, really um, relevant for myself. So I will spend some time to study that. And I really appreciate um, you sharing all of that information. Thank, Thank you, you so much. There is a question, uh, I reposted it. It comes from um, uh, uh, Jean. This is a great presentation. My question is, do you have some insights for this upcoming eclipse with the Cancer and Capricorn influence? Maybe its significance. Thank you. This probably refers to the solar eclipse that's just passed uh, close to solstice and that will happen again in Capricorn. Are there any astrologers Later. in the group that want to address that question? Is Kathy here or? No, we don't no, have a Kathy okay. not here. Well, I would 
simply point out that Cancer and Capricorn, although polar opposites, have a common destiny with humanity. And we know in the teachings that when these alignments take place, that they can be disruptive and negative, but they can be equally as creative and spiritual. And when those two signs come together in different aspects astrologically, it creates opportunity. And we know that Cancer is the door into incarnation. Capricorn is the door out of incarnation. Mm -hmm. And as the Tibetan has said, when the Capricorn can come to its knees on the Mount of Initiation at the third, he will have fulfilled his destiny, but has one more cycle to run. And I'm paraphrasing DK when I say this, he says he will now come back into incarnation as a cancer, as a perfect world server. So it'll give you an idea of cancer to Capricorn, back again, coming through cancer on a wider, more group level to serve the lighted house of the group. Anyone else like to comment on that alignment? Uh, Rebecca or Richards, you are unmuted. Oh, it's Rebecca here. Um, and I was just, um, it kind of relates to what you're saying, actually, Dwayne. Um, I was just thinking about what you were saying about the um, mass consciousness then getting expressed as group consciousness. and um then now you're you're speaking about the the um expression as the world server and i'm feeling like there's a relationship between the other signs so um, i'm wondering if you could talk to that so um the mass consciousness getting expressed as group consciousness seems like a um it manifests in the expression of aquarius um and then the world server as the expression of Pisces, but um, I just wondered if you could talk to that. One of the best presentations on the crosses was done by Francis Donald a couple of years back at the University of Seven Rays annual conference. And I took a lot away from that presentation, but one of the things that impressed me most of all was the fluidity of these crosses. In other words, let's take the fixed cross. It has four arms and, excuse me, let's take the mutable cross. It has four arms and each one relates to some quality we must develop. Doesn't matter which one of those arms we're born on, we need to synthesize the polar opposite and then eventually fuse with all arms of that cross. So that's the mutable cross. Then in the next cycle of development, you go into like soul development, it's the fixed cross. And you again synthesize the polar opposite of your sign, and it can be your sun sign or your, or your rising sign, and then, then draw off of all four arms. And that this second cross is built on the progress of the first cross. In other words, the first cross doesn't just disappear you are unconsciously or habitually or automatically working with the first cross when you're operating on the second cross. When you've mastered the second cross and you've gone to the cardinal cross, which we're primarily sharing today, it's because you have mastered the earlier crosses so that the ultimate end product to be a master is that you are drawing off of all 12 arms of those three sets of crosses. Now, granted, depending on your ray makeup and the work that you have been chosen to do, it may be more of one or the other, but it's just like the rays. 
to become a master, you have to master all the seven rays, but certain ones will predominate, predominantly be there because that's where your chosen area of service is. And that's why the master's ashrams are all connected through the seven rays, but each one is yet different because they have certain rays that they have to express in this cycle. Okay, I hope that was a little helpful. Rebecca, good Thank question. You. Thank you. Uh, Antonella, you wanted to share something, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Duane and Rose. Great, great presentation. Yes, I, I would add this, that cancer is also the collective individual. So we can see that uh, humanity as a, a collective individual uh, in the cardinal cross, uh, when there is a sign activated as now in cancer, is um, is demanded is called to uh, face the lesson of cancer and to me um, is the sense of um, yes the four arms of the cardinal cross to be um, fused uh, in in the center and um, oh yes i forgot what i had to say <laughs> that uh, <laughs> no, yes. Oh, yes, 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 um, yes, reminding the, the eclipses. Uh, in today's, we have also partial lunar eclipse, and we just had the solar uh, eclipse in this Cancer. And we have also the direction of Sirius in this sign. Um, so these two eclipses, the, the first eclipse is the solar eclipse on, on the 2nd of July. We have um, this direction uh, with the, the Sun, Earth, Saturn, Pluto and Sirius. So I think that it was um, a huge moment, um, as the K um, um, suggests, to take into account also the main uh, eclipses of the year. But this one was particularly potent, powerful because there were, well, there were this first ray Pluto, this third ray uh, Saturn, which the case says that the axis Cancer and Capricorn um, push humanity uh, towards the, the path of operation and uh, stimulate the sensitiveness of uh, humanity. So it's really related to this sensitivity development of, of mass consciousness into a new level of consciousness. It's like spirit uh, infusing the, the breath uh, of God into this matrix, which is the dark light of cancer. So, and this sense of um, uh, potentiality of this um, jump of, con of the sensitiveness of the disciple uh, humanity as as a, a collective individual so yes that's it excellent thank, thank you. you so much thanks to you ah, and also another thing um, in another um, part of the esoteric astrology the cave speaks about the relation between pleiades cancer and venus so it reminds me to the third ray, the third aspect of life, which is uh, intelligence of substance, which the Pleiades also veils. Yes. And, uh, and yes, and this electricity, the prana, the electricity of Pleiades, which uses this Cancer uh, gate and through Venus, which is also related to manas, to the intelligence. So I, yes. all the all we spoke about tonight about electricity of substance, the intelligence, the bridge, electric bridge. It, it to me is really <laughs> very good that was uh, happening just now. And thank you for uh, let it emerge in Cancer. Excellent. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think we are getting close to uh, the time of meditation. Okay. I, 
suggest we yes. um, shift our gears and bring everything that's been shared into our meditation to radiate to humanity. Over to you, Dwayne. One last thought before we do this meditation is beautifully summarized, and this is taken from the same quotes from esoteric astrology just further down where the Tibetan says, therefore, un until after the third initiation, as you have often been told, there is little to be known or said about that mysterious essence which is divinity in motion. Okay, this is a quote about the cardinal sign, but it equally applies to the three crosses, to the uh, three crosses we're working on the cardinal. Okay, now here's a visual image of the cardinal cross seen electrically. Mm -hmm. And Cancer, polar opposite of Capricorn, must come together and share their light and attributes for anyone born in either one of those aspects or signs. Same with Aries Libra. And Aries, we have power, the will the onrush of the elements. Libra, we have balance and the higher mind. Capricorn, we have grounding, uh, power, and also abstract thought. And in Cancer, you have sensitivity, compassion, and on other levels, you also have abstract thought and the ability to work in the mold of matter. So all of these must come together to one common point. And the video that we're going to show next demonstrates that very dynamically. And I want each person to imagine that they're standing in the middle of this cardinal cross. So let's start the meditation and then partially through the meditation, which is gonna be sort of guided, we're gonna move right into the video itself. So let's sound three ohms together. Oh. linking up as a group. Let us draw all of our energies up onto the high mental plane and seat our, see ourselves seated in love and standing in the center of this cardinal cross seen on the screen. Visualize yourself receiving its many gifts and qualities of light that make up this cross. Feel and sense intuitively the true meaning of spiritual synthesis as you watched the next short video. This video is accompanied by the Gayatri hymn, which we know is a hymn to the sun on three different levels.
Excellent. See these vast astrological forces we have outlined passing through the master's ashram, the many soul groups with which you work, and then down into the world of humanity as many saving forces. Visualize humanity's many crises being reconciled and healed by these powerful forces of love and spiritual reconstruction. See these lights grounding themselves into your individual lives and strengthening your important contributions and the contributions of your group brothers and sisters.
visualize all of these powerful forces grounded into the earth and making one complete electrical connection from the highest levels to the lowest. Let us now sound three ohms and say together as a group the great invocation. Oh. Rose is now going to lead us in the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center, which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Thank you for your participation. We love you and we appreciate the time you have spent with us and I'm now going to pass it over to Sasha. Thank you, Duane. Thank you, Rose. Truly electrical. Today is the first day of the five days period of the full moon, so we will continue our group meditation, meditation staying telepathically tuned as one group for the next 
several days and beyond. And I want to invite you to join our coming webinars. In a way, the 2025 initiative aligns with the vision that Dwayne and Rose outlined today and our program throughout this year is structured by the crosses and in the science of the cardinal cross we work with the topic of the vision as we do today and in the next sign of Leo we will be working with the energy of the fixed cross and this year we bring group focus to the topic of discipleship and group work and under the sign of Leo we will invite everyone to work meditate on the topic of the fires of the group work and we also want to invite you to join our ongoing meditation on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and this work happens uh, throughout the cycles of the new moons so the coming leo new moon we will be focusing on the sustainable development goal to zero hunger so we invite you to join us on august 3rd and also through your daily meditation bring your focus to the goal to zero hunger and let's share together when we get on the webinar platform on August 3rd and meditate, strengthening the thought forms of zero hunger for humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Dwayne. Namaskar. Thank you.